My wife Jessica and I, we've been married for 21 years this year. Yeah, got it right. Um, kids that are 16, 14, 12, and 10. Did I get that right? And um, yeah, we, we've been part of Salt and Light, which is what, what Gateway East is part of for a long time. So uh, I came to Gateway as a young kid in the 90s. Grew up in Gateway, in, in Gateway, what's now Gateway North, but Gateway Panet at the time. Um, in 2012, we felt the call to go to Landmark, uh, which is where we live now. And so we pastored in Landmark at a church there that was part of Salt and Light as well for almost 11 years. And I'll get into that a little bit this morning, but um, earlier this year, um, the Lord clearly called us out of that. Um, and so now I'm back into um, another industry, and I'm back in the marketplace, and um, back in a very, very different environment than the church. And um, I think that's where that's going to kind of connect a little bit this morning, what I'm going to talk about, because there's, there's a lot of connecting points there for me about what God is doing in my life and, and what I'm seeing him doing um, in the marketplace. So... Um, as part of my, my work now that I'm doing, um, actually quite surprisingly, I was invited to go to Portugal this fall. And so I was there on a sales trip uh, at a supplier that we work with. And so I got to go to the old city of Porto in Portugal, which is an unbelievable city. If you've never been in that part of Portugal, it's one of the oldest cities in Europe from what I understand. There's incredible history there. And so I had a free day there before I left, and so I went and I toured some of the old part of the city, and I went to some of the old uh, Roman Catholic churches that they have there that are from the, I think, 11th and 12th century. And and we walked into one, and it was the Agrio do Carmo, if I'm pronouncing that right, this old, old church there. And we go, I went in, and, and I don't have pictures, but I was struck by... The, the whole sanctuary, if you will, there, and how profound it was, and, and not in a, necessarily a good way. What I was struck by was this weird focus all over on the crucified Jesus. There was these various depictions of Jesus in his suffering and in his state of crucifixion, and, and even they had Jesus in this weird sort of burial state. And I'm looking at it, and I'm going... Where's the risen Jesus? But along with that was this kind of interesting, weird fascination with Mary that was mixed into it all. And I was, and I was looking at some of these depictions they had like built into the walls. And I'm like, and, and this, this sort of elevated state of Mary. And, and you know, what I, what I was struck with as I thought about that and as I was preparing for this morning was there was, there's this removal of her humanity in that. And so what I want to do this morning is we're going to look a little bit closer at the coming of Jesus through Luke's account of Mary. And I think we're going to see the humanity of Mary this morning in a way that we need to see it. And so I've titled this morning, Trusting God Amidst the Unknown. And we're going to see in scripture this morning that What's interesting about Mary, and this is what I find so interesting about the elevation of Mary in some parts of faith, she doesn't make it about herself. (laughs) We've turned this into now making this weird fascination with Mary, and she never made it about herself, as we see in Scripture. We don't actually know a lot about Mary. We, We get glimpses of her throughout a little bit here and there in the Gospels. We don't know a lot. Um... Two of the Gospels, Mark and John, they don't even talk about her at all. They don't talk about her in relation to the birth of Jesus and, and, and this. So it's only Matthew that does a little bit. And then it's Luke who really gets into the account of Jesus' coming and his birth and all of that. And some of the, the details are on that. Because Luke was all about facts, right? Luke, was all, his Gospel is all about we're going to get the facts right. Which is, I love that. So... I'm going to move this over here. So I'm getting used to how different, different environment, right? So bear with me. Um, Luke is the one who says a lot about Mary. So we know that she's in Nazareth. 
Nazareth. We know that she's in this small town in the region of Galilee. And that she's a virgin. Now, what that's meant to communicate is that she's not married. But she was pledged to be married to this guy named Joseph. And we're told that her name is Mary, this virgin. So that's where we start. So if you want to open up your Bibles, if you have them with you, and I'm going to read this. I think there's a handout this morning as well. So you'll have the scripture on your handout. So we're going to read to start verse 26 to 38. So in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. So, we have to be careful when we read this account, when we hear this, to go, this sounds like it could be sort of a fairy tale. Like, this story is strange, right? Right? Like, like it's, it's weird. There's, there's aspects of this account of this angel coming to Mary and going, this is weird. This is, this is, this is far out stuff. And it brings up a lot of questions. And I think as part of that, this is, this is the dangers that we can some, in a way we go, I don't know if I can relate to this. Like this is 2000 years ago, give or take. And it's in a very different world. It's not in this technological world of smartphones and social media and TikTok and all this stuff. And how in the world can I relate to this girl that's in Galilee in this region in the Middle East 2,000 years ago? How does that somehow make sense with my life today in 21st century North America? And we kind of can go, yeah, that's, that's not for me. And I, and I want to just guard us against that because we have the same condition as Mary regardless of culture and time. And that's called the human condition. That Yeah, there's different external pressures. Yes, there's different psychological pressures now. Things have changed, absolutely. But still, we have the same essence as Mary and, and all that to say that if you allow yourself, I believe that we can see these situations that we, the situation we see here as relatable to us if we allow ourselves to see it. And for you girls who are here, I'm just, there's girls of you here that are teenagers. This is definitely relatable because Mary was your age. Like Mary was probably 13 or 14, I think, if I'm right with... The historical accounts. So, 13 or 14 year old girl. <laughs> so, three things I want to highlight with Mary here. One, Mary is dealing with complex emotions. It says there in the text that she was greatly troubled. Now, what that means is she was agitated, confused, perplexed, to be thrown into disorder. 
That's, that's what that word there means in the original language. So when you hear greatly troubled, she's dealing with a lot of stuff. Put yourself in the moment. Okay, as guys, it's a little bit harder to put yourself in this moment. But let's put ourselves in the moment. You have an angel of the Lord coming into your house speaking to you. Giving you probably the best greeting you could ever get. The Lord is with you. You are highly favored. Like, if I hear that I'm going, man, that has a tendency to inflate my ego a little bit. Ego. Sorry, not eagle. Ego. Now, you can be, you can understand though, right? If Mary is a little bit unsettled by the whole situation. Angel, a supernatural being in my house speaking to me with words that carry a lot of weight. So there's this account I read in this uh, book, Miracles by Eric Metaxas, a few years ago. And there was this one, he has a bunch of stories in that book about miracles, people that have encountered God in supernatural ways. And one of them that struck me was a guy in New York City that encountered angelic beings. God basically like took away the veil for a brief second and he saw these angelic beings in the church above them. And he describes that situation. It is mind-blowing to realize how incredible these angelic beings are. Like, they're, they, are, they will, like, go, whoa. So this isn't, like, kind of, like, this whole situation with Mary is a bit of a, whoa. And, and I think, too, there's times, now when we get back to this thing of, Mary is greatly troubled. Don't, don't, don't just move on from that right away when you read this. Because there's times that we can feel that with such visceral force in our lives. Where we feel deep anguish, where we feel deep despair, where we're feeling confusion, where we're angry, or we're feeling some sense of disorder in our lives. I'm going, I, I don't know what to do with this. See, like, it's, it's one little part of that verse, right? But I think if you put yourself into this situation of going, what Mary's, what she's encountering here... This is something to stop and to go, okay, this is, this is important. Because it's the human condition. So for me, this was part of the story that, that Ken mentioned earlier this morning. This was me earlier this year leaving full-time ministry, leading a church. And, and I can tell you that at the time, it felt like an absolutely agonizing decision for us and for me. Like to the point where I felt physically sick through the process of, are we actually really, is this what we're going to do? And I, I can recall several times in my life where I've, I've felt, I would say, greatly troubled. Right? I've, I've had those, and you, we can probably all think of that. Those times in our lives where you go, I remember that time where, man, I was dealing with a real sense of confusion or frustration or just going like, what is going on? Yeah. And, and granted, <laughs> in, for me in these situations and probably for every single one of us, although tell me if you're different, you probably haven't had an angelic being in your house. Sure. If you have, that's, let me know. But remember too that, that prior to this, to, to Jesus' coming, God had been silent for 400 years with his people. Now, do you know how long that is? Think about that now in relation to where we are. 400 years ago for us was when was the first publication of the King James Bible. That's 400 years ago. 400 years ago, Shakespeare had just died. Remember that guy? <laughs> so, put 400 years ago... We're living now. God has not spoken to us since then. Nothing. No prophetic utterances. 
no prophets, nothing. And yet, God's people continue to wait for this promise of redemption that he said would come. And I, so I think in all this, it's understandable why Gabriel, in the moment, says to Mary, don't be afraid. You, fear is an understandable emotion here. When we don't understand what God is doing, how many of you, when you don't understand a situation of what God is doing, you're like, I don't know what's going on here. Fear is quick to set up shop in your life. We need to hear in those moments, God is with us. If, if I allow myself just a little bit to go down the road of where we are right now in our culture, where we are in our country, where we are with our economy, I can feel fear wanting to set up shop. God is with us. The Ma- and Gabriel says to Mary there, he says, you have found favor with God in verse 30. That, that's incredible. That, that, is, that statement, you, why? Like, why, why has she found favor with God? Scripture speaks of those who are righteous as finding favor with God. Psalm 512, you bless the righteous, you surround them with your favor as with a shield. Psalm 3415, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. So we see that Mary has complex emotions. What else do we see here? Well, we see that she has questions. At least one big question, but she's probably got a bunch of questions. Verse 34, she says to, to Gabriel, she says, how will this be? Like, okay. And, and we know that Mary... She's not like Zechariah, right? Zechariah previously, when the angel came to Zechariah to tell the, 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 fa- the husband of Elizabeth, to tell him that Elizabeth was going to have a baby in old age, and he's like, he obviously had some level of unbelief because the angel was like, you're not going to talk for the rest of her pregnancy. You're done, Zechariah. <laughs> because you're probably going to speak a bunch of garbage that isn't true, so zip. <laughs> Mary doesn't get that here. She asks how... But she's not asking, obviously, in a state of unbelief. Because the angel takes, Gabriel takes the question and goes, well, actually, I'm going to tell you exactly how it's going to happen. And for Mary, I mean, it's cultural norms, right? She's like, look, I'm not married. So if I'm not married, I'm not getting pregnant. Um, How's that going to happen? So, and, and, and the other question is, why is this detail important? Because this is about the promises and the faithfulness of God. Matthew highlights this promise as well in his gospel, probably because he's writing to a Jewish audience. But he says in his gospel, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said. The Lord had said it through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 7, 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. He shall be called Emmanuel. God is with us. But there's another reality to this situation too in all this. When we think about it, Mary's got plans. She's She's pledged to be married to Joseph. She's got her whole life in front of her. She's walked righteously before the Lord. She's got this. This is, this is how she's probably got in her head, right? An idea like all of us. This is how my life is going to go. This is how my life is going to go with Joseph. This is how, this is what's going to happen with us. This is a major disruption. And so it brings up more than a few questions. And so again, this is where, this is so relatable because we have questions. We have many questions. We don't, many times in our lives, 
you're like me, you don't understand everything that's happening. Why, why is this happening? Why is that happening? Why, why did that have to happen, God? Why, why, did, why did it have to go like that? Why, why did my time in Landmark and all the plans and all the th- purposes I thought that God had for us, why did it have to end like that? There's, there's a lot of this thing in our lives, of the tension in the waiting. You know, it's interesting. So, so the, new, the new job that I have now, the new career, so I, I'm sort of in the steel industry now. I sell fabrication equipment uh, for those people who fabricate metal. So if you don't understand what that means, it's okay. Anything that bends, forms, cuts metal is what I do. And I actually, I really enjoy it. I really, really like it. But what's interesting about the, the role that I'm in and, and dealing with customers is that we're not like a commodity-based role. So before where I was selling raw material, raw steel, to a lot of different companies all over Manitoba in my previous job, that, that was an ongoing commodity base where you're always selling lots of material. And you just kind of get used to that. Well, now... I can deal on machinery for months. There, 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 will be, there will be equipment that we're dealing with customers where it may take months to close an order. And there's this back and forth, and it's, it's highly technical, and, and it's highly relational as well, and there's lots of competition. And, I'm co- and I've come into this this year, and I'm learning, because I number one, what I like to do, I like to close orders. I like to win. I like the chase of sales. I lo- actually, I love it. Like, I really, really enjoy it. I love, I love dealing with customers in that way and going after stuff. And then I have to realize, oh, there's the tension in the waiting of sometimes I don't know how something's going to turn out. And, and it's happened where I've, I've thought for sure we're going to land this order, and we don't. I think there's a lot of that in our lives. This thing of going, this tension in the waiting. There's also fear in waiting. Again, there's this thing of fear. And Satan's prowling around and he is seeking to have us live out of all sorts of fear. See, this is the thing about me leaving full-time ministry earlier this year. I knew that it was time to leave. And I know that now with even more certainty as I've gotten more perspective as time goes along. And, and, I, and I think that at the time, I knew, I'd already known for a while that it was time. And yet, I kept trying to convince myself that somehow we could make it work. And there was this on, like this ongoing play, almost playing mind games with myself. I'm like, no, we're, we're, this, this can still work. Before God really shut the door and said, Paul, you're done. Do you know why those, so much of those things were happening that I was, that I was battling with? Fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of going, I don't know what's next. I don't know what God has for us. I don't know how God's going to provide for our family. And that's just me being real. You, should, you could have said, Paul, you should be walking in more faith. Yeah, probably. Paul, you're not trusting God enough. Yeah, you're right. That's, that's my human condition. I, I get it. You know, I had unanswered questions a lot. I didn't know what God was doing. And, and how many of you, and you, you don't need to raise your hands, but how many of you, if you're honest, going, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with fear in my life. Trust is believing that God is faithful and good even when we don't see or understand. And in response to Mary's faith, God tells her, through Gabriel, exactly what he's going to do. And you know, for me, verse 37 is so encouraging. I don't, when we read it even, like, wasn't that so encouraging? Where verse 37, for no word from God will ever fail. 
And yet, like, we have to be careful that we don't co-opt our own personal desires into this, right? Like, this is important that we don't go, I want this so much that now that's the word from the Lord and he's going to do it no matter what. No, that's, that's not what this is. This is no word from God in his word will ever fail. Now, can you be given at times a personal word from the Lord that he will see to fulfill? Yes, but we're not going to get in. That's, that's a bit of a Pandora's box. <laughs> But the point is, God's word will never fail when he has spoken something. Okay, i got to get moving here. Third thing we see here, Mary is responsive to the Lord. Verse 38. You know, that, that her response to Gabriel when he tells her everything, how, what God's going to do, how he's going to do it, it really bears attention because Mary, this, Mary states here how she sees herself. She says, I am the Lord's servant. She is fully surrendered to the Lord. Second, Mary states her heart posture to what she's heard. She says, may your word to me be fulfilled. May what you've said, Lord, over me and over my life, may it be accomplished. May the word of God find fertile ground in my heart. I think this is part of the reason we see here why Mary found favor with God. Because even Mary's next actions, and we don't know the time frame here, but as soon as this this encounter with Gabriel is done, what does she do? She goes to find Elizabeth. Why? Because the angel said, Elizabeth, Elizabeth wasn't supposed to have kids. That was a miracle. And Mary's like, I'm going to go and see my cousin. Like, is this actually happening? It's it's Mary's operating in faith. Okay, this is where we're going to wrap up this morning. I'm going to read verses 1, Luke 1, 46 to 55, and then we'll spend a few minutes and then we'll wrap up. This was Mary's response. So she sees Elizabeth, and that encou- after that encounter, this is what Mary says. Now, actually, in, in our... This is actually very likely a song. The formatting in your Bible is that way because this is actually probably something that Mary sang. So Mary said or Mary sang, My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Again, given the situation, this response is profound. It's so challenging. Like Mary's world is about to be turned upside down. The rest of her life is going to be completely different from what she would have anticipated it to be. The implications of what's going to come for her, hardship, suffering, pain, the unknown. Selfishly, Mary could have been like, why me? And Mary's response, though, isn't the, she's not focused on self. She's not like, oh, look at me, the blessed and the favored one. Look at me. Look who I am. Look what God said over me. That's not her response. What this is, these words here, they're saturated with Old Testament scripture. There's at least 12 references here to the Old Testament. This, this whole song from Mary mirrors Hannah's song in 1 Samuel as well. The point that it makes for us is that Mary's heart and her mind was saturated in the word of God. She had saturated herself for years and it just came out of her. 
So I want to just quickly hear just four things. They're on your sheets. I want to highlight four things that we see here from Mary out of this song that she said. First is that her joy is in the Lord. It's her initial utterance. Her soul magnifies the Lord. She's she's saying my entire being, my entire life, my existence praises and lifts high the Lord. She says my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. She's that, that word there is the same word as breath, which is the word pneuma in the Greek. And that it's conveying, she's conveying there this sense of that which gives me consistent life, my breath, which gives me the very way that I have life, my breath, finds extreme joy in God. Mary has saturated her soul with the promises of God. There, there's this longing and this anticipation that's in her. You know what it does for me is it goes, okay, Paul, are you finding enough time in your life to saturate yourself in the word of God and in the presence of God? And let me be honest, it's actually a lot harder now that I'm in business. Time is actually a lot harder to find. I don't, I don't get paid anymore to study. Second thing that we see about Mary here is uh, the, her eyes are on the Lord. You know, all throughout these verses, verses 50 to 54 there, what, is, what does she say? His mercy, he has performed, he has brought down, he has filled, he has helped. It's every single sort of iteration here is um, my eyes are on the Lord. My eyes are on the Lord. My eyes are on the Lord. This is all about Jesus. This is all about the Lord. You know, when my eyes are on myself, when my eyes are on my situations, on my feelings, on my failings, it gets ugly pretty quick. Yeah. It's not good. But when I'm reminded to get my eyes on the Lord... It's this funny thing that happens. My perspective shifts. You know when when we get our eyes on the Lord and not on everything else? We see situations differently, actually. You'll look at at the same situation. You will look at it completely differently. Psalm 34, 18 says this. It says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. I think that last song that we sang this morning, it's all about that. Come all of you who are unfaithful, who are weary, and I can't remember all the words, but it, I thought, yeah, like that, that, that. Folks, that's the heart of the gospel. It's the heart of who Jesus is. Because it's fair to say, I think, for Jess and I and our whole family to an extent, that that was us earlier this year when we left the church. There, there was, we, we've walked through brokenheartedness. And we, we need, and st- we've, we've received and we still need healing. But you know what I remind myself? The Lord is close to us. When we're in those seasons of our lives, the Lord is close to you. Third thing we see about Mary, she's humble before the Lord. She refers twice here to humility, to the humble in these verses, verse 48 and 52. God is mindful of the humble. He lifts up the humble. James 4, just quoting Proverbs 3, right? God opposes the proud. What does, he, what does he give to the humble? Grace. You know, I, I, I love this. I, I, uh, I was reading something. It was probably even a couple years ago already, and I've just, I, it's stuck with me ever since. I can't remember where I quite read it, but Jesus doesn't define himself a lot in the Gospels. He doesn't, he doesn't make a point of, of having to define himself. He's not really all that concerned about what people think of him. But when he does, Matthew 11, there's that one little part there where he does actually 
define himself and who he is. And you know what he says? I, he says, I'm gentle and humble in heart. At the very essence of who Jesus, our king, is, he's humble. And you know what he says there? He says, take my yoke, meaning let, let, let me, who I am, come on you. Let, let, put me on you. Learn from me. And you'll find rest for your souls. I'm learning this slowly. But there's a direct correlation between humility and becoming more like Jesus. Do you want to know one thing I've noticed in the business world, in the marketplace, since I've gotten back into it, that, that I, I dealt with it just this week. I went away from a, uh, a visit, an interaction with a customer, and I was like, man, there's so much pride. There's so much pride that is just natural to the human condition and how we operate. And we think it's okay. If you want to become more like Jesus, embrace, embrace humility. Last thing we see here about Mary, she's trusting in the Lord's faithfulness. She says in verse 48, he's been mindful of my state. Verse 49, she says, the mighty one, the mighty one has done great things for me. Here's the thing. This is true of every one of us. This isn't just for Mary. You know why we know that? Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 says you were lost. You were without hope. You were separated from God. You were done. Apart from God, you are, you are lost. You're lost in sin. You're lost in wickedness and darkness. Game over. And then there's the greatest but in Ephesians 2. But... Because of his great mercy. In Christ Jesus, it says in Ephesians 2, you who are in Christ now have been brought near to God by the blood of Jesus. It says there in Ephesians 2, by grace you have been saved. That this favor that Mary has rests on us. And we know this too because Luke 2, when Jesus is taken into the temple to be dedicated, and Simeon's there, and he says there, For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Unless you're Jewish, that's you. That's me. And the glory of your people, Israel. You know, it's interesting, right? We, we, I, I asked earlier, I said, what, what is it with Mary finding favor with God? It says that God's favor is on the righteous in Scripture. But you know, when, when the angels come to the shepherds in Luke 2 and they announce the coming of his birth, they say, peace to whom his favor rests. You know that that's open to every single one of us. That's the offer of the gospel. Everything is found in Jesus. I also recognize, and I think this is really important actually at Christmas and during the Advent season. For many people, this time of year is hard. This, is, this actually is a painful time of year. There's probably some of you sitting here right now going, this whole coming season is hard. Painful memories, broken families, grief, and brokenheartedness. We don't need to try to brush that off and avoid it. We don't need to try to hide that, bury it down, and go, I don't want to touch that. I don't want to deal with that. Jesus came to bring healing to us. He has done incredible things for us. Mary said he's done great things for me. The message of this is, behold, he has done great things 
for us. And so I want to end here just by saying that we're looking at Mary, we're talking about Mary. Mary wouldn't want this to be about her. This really wasn't about Mary, actually. This was really about the coming of the one that we all need. This is what Gabriel said to Mary. This is the, about the son of the Most High. This is about the one who's been given the throne of David and is the true ruler over Israel. This is the one whose kingdom will never end. This is the one whose name is Jesus and is truly great. What, what, what we're looking at this morning, this is the beginning of God's rescue that changed everything for all of history. History is different because of this. And so, like Mary, we can trust amidst the unknown and acknowledging, man, I struggle with that. Because why? Because the kingdom of God will never end. The word of God, no word of, from God, will ever, ever fail.